right, everyone, welcome back. It's another episode of the Wobcast 2.0. It's episode four, a perfect beginning for your Minnesota Vikings. I am your host, Mike Wobshaw, joined as always by Giles and Chase, and we are here to guide you on a discussion about the NFL and specifically the Minnesota Vikings in week one. And this week, it is a positive discussion as the Vikings start with a bang a big time victory over the Green Bay Packers and what was a very significant game for the Vikings franchise, also for Green Bay, but I think more specifically for the Minnesota Vikings. We're going to get into that later on in the show. Also later in episode four of Wobcast 2.0 is a review of what else happened in the NFC North with the Chicago Bears and the Detroit Lions. We'll get into some stories from around the National Football League, and we'll look ahead to the Vikings' next game, which is Week 2, Monday Night Football, and the Philadelphia Eagles, who of late in the last five or six years have kind of become a rival of the Minnesota Vikings, if you will, a non-division rival. Of course, you have the Bears, Packers, and Lions, but I think Vikings fans have developed a rivalry with a few other franchises outside the division. I would put the Eagles among that group, along with the Saints and the Seahawks. So a quasi rivalry come a rivalry game coming up for the Minnesota Vikings against the Eagles. And we'll preview that in segment five before we give you a prediction on the game and then close the show. Let's kick things off, though, with how the Vikings kicked off the 2022 season. And that was perfectly. It was a perfect beginning for the Minnesota Vikings. And what do we mean by that? Well, It is a period of transition for the Vikings franchise with a new GM and a new head coach. So it's an out with the old in with the new and not just a change of old and new in terms of the old coach. Mike Zimmer is gone. The new coach O'Connell is in, but it's a changing of the guard. It's a changing of philosophy. It's a young offensive minded head coach after a veteran defensive minded head coach. And it's the new school, younger GM in Quezia Adolfo Mensa, as opposed to someone like Rick Spielman, who again was a veteran, um, maybe of the old guard, you may say, someone who did things very fundamentally and very traditionally. So big time changes for the Vikings organization. And how do they start the season? Well, they start the season with the Green Bay Packers and what was a huge game for the Minnesota Vikings. And they didn't just win, but they won handily in this game, 23 to seven, starting off hot in the first half and then closing the game out very solidly in the second half. And guys, I think what sort of encapsulated this outcome to me or this game to me was if you saw it was Kirk Cousins in the locker room after the game where it wasn't like a huge, like rah, rah, like pound my chest. Um, You like that moment for Kirk. It was a very calculated, intentional, thoughtful Let's give a game ball to Kwesi and to Kevin O'Connell for their first wins as Minnesota Vikings. I just thought it was a poignant moment for Kirk and the organization because the talking point leading up to this season around the Vikings has been, let's see how Cousins does with a different head coach, with an offensive-minded head coach who's going to make him feel good and make him feel comfortable and empower him. And through one week of the season, Giles, Chase, you know, so far so good. It's almost, it's got to feel like a sense of vindication for people who are on that side, that Kirk Cousins anti Zimmer side of the fence. So the key on this, this week, one thing is, you know, you, a lot of times what happens is there's this overreaction after games on Tuesdays every week, but I think that's amplified after week one, you know, you get big time overreaction Tuesdays. And then a lot of times you get a regression to the mean the following week, and you find that the truth is somewhere in between. So without seeing week two, I I can, I can probably sense there's going to be somewhat of a regression to the mean, but that the week one, especially in the first half performance was so good that even a slight regression, I think is going to put the Vikings in a really good spot. Um, I want to say something about Kevin O'Connell because he's a rookie head coach and rookie head coaches across the league had a good week in week one. There's five of them and they were four and one in week one. Kevin O'Connell had one of those victories. The other uh, winners were Mike McDaniel in Miami, Brian Dayball in, uh, in New York with the Giants, O'Connell. You had Matt Eberflus in uh, Chicago. Um, of course, Nathaniel Hackett and the Broncos were, were the only loss of rookie head coaches. And I'm not, I, I, we mentioned this in an earlier episode of the Wobcast. 
I am not surprised that the Vikings came out and looked sharp and buttoned up on offense with Kevin O'Connell. And if you wanted to take an angle against O'Connell and the Vikings and having success in, in Kevin's first year, it's that, Hey, this guy came from the McVay tree. He's never called plays. Let's see if he really knows what he's doing. Well, I mean, I just got the sense from listening to him, from watching them uh, uh, at training camp in the preseason that O'Connell kind of knew what he was doing. And it certainly looked that way in week one. And I was listening to Sirius XM NFL radio where one of the hosts, Kirk Morrison, was speaking and he did the game, I believe, for a radio network in week one, uh, Vikings Packers. He did the game and he was a teammate of Kevin O'Connell's at San Diego State. And Kirk Morrison was talking and explaining that he spoke with Kevin O'Connell before the game and asked him, hey, you got to be nervous. It's your first game, first time being a head coach. And O'Connell was like, I, I truly am not nervous because of all the preparation that we put into this game to be ready for it. And so um, I really think, I really believe that. I believe that O'Connell was not nervous. I believe that they were buttoned up and prepared. I bet you they were very confident going into this game and it all sort of came to fruition for them. So um, I think they're building momentum as an organization and some of the other changes or one other change I, that I want to reference um, that the organization is going through that looked good in week one was a change in defense from a philosophical standpoint, going away from a four, three and a, an even man front to an odd man front a three, four. Um, and, and that obviously looked really good. I thought there were a few holes in the run game every now and then, but nothing that ever got out of control. And they clearly made Aaron Rodgers look confused during the game. Um, look confused. And if he wasn't confused, he was frustrated because someone else was confused and Rogers got frustrated with that. So um, i really, truly feel not to overhype this or not to, um, you know, put the cart in front of the horse, but I really, truly think this was essentially a perfect beginning for the Vikings. Um, the way they started what and who looked good and against, uh, and, and the opponent that it was, just a perfect beginning for a franchise that is uh, in transition and is trying to turn over a new leaf and maybe turn the tide in the NFC North. And if this is the year that the tide gets turned uh, in the NFC North, we're going to look back at week one and say that that's sort of where it began. Um, all right, let's um, let's get into sort of a more detailed or specific recap of the win. Um, and Giles Chase, I'll, I'll leave this to you guys, but you know, I think what we saw from Justin Jefferson, it's more of the same uh, from week one or from uh, season one for him. But it's significant because, again, if you wanted to take an angle against Justin Jefferson this season, it would be, well, let's see if he can do it, you know, year two. Now we got tape on him. So let's see if, what teams do to adjust. They had a pretty dang good corner on the other side and Jair Alexander and actually a pretty good defense in general. And it, it was like Justin Jefferson was going against air. A very impressive debut this season for Justin Jefferson, fellas. Yeah, I just I wasn't sure. Well, as I was watching the game, it just seemed like the Packers didn't game plan for him at all. Um, when we're talking about the top receivers in the league, Justin Jefferson's definitely in that conversation. And yeah, you know, it just sounded or just looked like they had no answer for him, which, which is weird to me because, like you said, Jair Alexander, one of the top uh, DBs in the league, you'd think that he would take it personally and he would be on the yeah. entire game. It wasn't that way. And even Jair after the game was upset because he said, th he said, he's like, these are the days I live for and a guy robbed for me. Um, and it's like, well, I don't know. I, I think Justin Jefferson torched him, but I also think it was all also a slight product of the Packers game plan. I just don't think they did anything right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and you might be right about that. I thought for the most part, cousins was protected pretty well also, you know, and again, Going back to just the common theme of this game, a perfect beginning for so many parts of the Vikings organization. How about Zadarius Smith? Mm. A perfect beginning for him. He was with the Green Bay Packers last year. He comes to the Vikings and has something to prove. Mm -hmm. And not only do they win and win handily, but Rodgers looks frustrated because he's getting hit by Zadarius Smith, right? And, um, you know, there's some other uh, former Packer personnel on this team as well uh, on the coaching staff, and I'm sure they felt pretty good about this win and, and the way it transpired. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, I, I think uh, a perfect beginning for Justin Jefferson um, and, and Zadarius Smith. I, I believe that when we want to look at trends or isolated events, uh, you know, I think the Justin Jefferson performance is going to be a trend, like that we're going to see more of that this season for the Vikings in his sophomore season. 
if Zadarius Smith can keep it up or not, that's one I would say let I'm on the fence on that one. Um, but it looked pretty good. That Smith Daniel Hunter combination looked pretty good. So I, I wouldn't even name that as an isolated event. Um, one thing that I do think is, um, is probably something we're not going to see much of is the Packers averaged over six yards per carry against the Vikings. And I think that was an isolated event. I don't think teams are going to be running with that much productivity against this Vikings defense. I just saw too many good things on tape, too many good things in the middle of that defensive line. Um, so, um, although the numbers don't look good, I actually came away fairly impressed with, um, with how the Vikings played defense in, uh, on the interior against the run. So um, I know that um, Giles is dying to chime in here, but he's got a bad connection right now and he's muted his mic. So he is forced to do what you all are doing. And that's listen to me and chase talk about this exciting win that the Vikings had over the green Bay Packers. Last thing I want to talk about chase is something I, I sort of alluded to earlier, but I want to dig down a little bit more into it. And that's just how green Bay looked and acted during the game, specifically Aaron Rodgers. to me watching it on TV. And I don't know Rogers personally, but I've been around him and I've studied him, you know, having been with the club for most of his, for all of his career, really, I was with the Vikings, you know, he, he definitely looked out of place chase. I mean, he, he did not look himself. He's had sure. plenty of games where he didn't play well, the Packers lost, but he remained confident and just took it on the chin and got mm -hmm. back up and kept swinging. That was not his demeanor on Sunday against the Vikings. And I think he will bounce back and I think he's going to have a fine season, but on Sunday, he looked uncomfortable. He looked banged up and frustrated and sometimes confused. For sure. Um, I think you got to look back to last season as well when talking about this, because week one last year for the Packers, I want to say they lost like 38 to three, uh, correct yes. me if that's yes. wrong, but yep. it was the saints and they just got totally embarrassed in week one. And how did that season end for them? They were, they were like good. one or two seed events in the good. NFC. So I just think, you know, Aaron Rodgers had an MVP season that year. Um, so week one might just not be their thing. I saw a stat that said something about Matt LaFleur. Um, his record as the Packers head coach is around like a 75% win percentage. Yeah. Yep. Um, but his uh, week one, but he's had four week ones and he's two and two in those. Um, yeah. So week one might just not be the Packers friend. I don't know, but we'll have to see, I guess. And, and so you're, you're hitting on something, Chase, that I wanted to get to actually. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I did not, I have to go back and verify that this is correct. Uh, Cause I think I'm remembering the stat correctly that I referenced, but if you go back to last season and you look at the teams who made the playoffs um, and I believe played on wild card weekend. Um, there was 12 of those teams. They were eight and four in week one. Okay. So four teams that ended up making the playoffs yeah. were 0 and one in week one. And those four teams won their division, ended up winning their division. So to your point, hmm. you know, week one does not a season make it's or a break. Very long season. Okay. It's a long season. And I, I do truly feel not to poo poo the Vikings victory at all, or to poo poo the Vikings position relative to the Packers historically, or currently, this was a bigger game for the Vikings. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was a momentum. This wasn't the impetus to a, a gain of momentum that can carry them through the early part of the season, which is a challenging stretch. Um, this was not an insignificant game for green Bay, but it was, Hey, you know what? It's their home opener. It's a, an organization that is on fire right now that loves their new regime, that it's a hard building to go into and win. You know, we are their nemesis, like target on our back. They had to know that something like this was coming and I'm sure they gave it their best shot to try and win. But and I'm not going to say they were chalking this one up as a loss, but the Packers did not have this game circled on their calendars, you know, last March or, you know, April, they just didn't, you know, and um, they're going to move on to their nemesis this week. Their nemesis is the bears. I mean, you ask any Packers fan or member of the organization, their rival is the bears and that's who they play this week on Sunday night football. So I don't think they were overlooking the Vikings. Uh, you know, I don't think it's insignificant to them, but it was more significant for the Vikings to win that game than it was uh, for the Packers and a loss for the Vikings in that spot would have been a huge delay in the start of a season and what will really put them against the wall this week, going to Philly, a team that won on the road last week 
and their home opener. And we'll get into more uh, on that matchup later in the show. So uh, that kind of wraps up our recap of the Vikings win, a momentous win, one that Kevin O'Connell will always remember and one that we may look back and really remember with significance if the Vikings are able to win the NFC North this season. Um, the last sort of caution, cautionary flag I want to throw out there, I don't want to throw water on the fire. The Vikings did not score a touchdown in the second half. So it wasn't a perfect game or a perfect performance, but it was the perfect way to begin the season for the Vikings mm-hmm. against that team and in that style with who played well. All right. Uh, segment three, let's do a little NFC North review, Chase. Um, yeah. The Vikings and Bears win. So they are 1-0 atop the division. The Packers and the Lions lose. The Packers and the Bears play this week on Sunday Night Football. The Vikings are at Philly. The Lions remain at home and will play host to the Commanders um, as Washington comes to town. The Bears had an upset at home of the San Francisco 49ers. They, um, it was obviously terrible field conditions, if anyone saw it. Soldier Field kind of always in a state of disrepair, if you will, but especially last Sunday with the monsoon that was happening there. Were you impressed with the Bears, Chase, or were you unimpressed with the Niners? Um, it was definitely more me being unimpressed with the Niners. Okay. Um, I also look more at the Niners loss than I do at the Bears win because I don't, frankly, I just don't believe in the Bears. And yeah. I think come the end of the season when we potentially could be in the wild card race, um, having the 49ers lose to the Bears could be a very big thing for us instead of True. having the Bears lose to the 49ers. Agreed. So. Great point. Yep. Great point. Uh, Lions, they, um, they fell behind early to the Philadelphia Eagles and then they came back, but ended up falling short. So I believe the Lions are one of these semi-darlings, if you will, because mm-hmm. of hard knocks. They're the hard knocks darlings. Okay. Anytime a franchise, and I, I said this to our Chase, when I was with the team for 15 years, you know, and the possibility came up of hard knocks, of the Vikings being on hard knocks, you know, for good reasons. Um, the head coaches that I always worked with and, and the GM, Rick Spielman, were hesitant to do it and, and tended to not want to do it. And I understood why, to- totally understood it. Secretly, though, I was rooting that we would be one of the teams and we never were. And, and I truly didn't believe that it's a competitive advantage or disadvantage to be on hard knocks. I really just don't believe that, that there is one. And if you can eke one out, I think it is so marginal that it's not even really worth mentioning. But I think almost every time from a PR, from a fan standpoint, from a general consensus or an aura around your club, it's positive. And it showcases a lot of parts of your organization operations, the kitchen staff, security, uh, personnel, scouts, it makes them all look good. And they are all doing a great job, but not everyone sees it. On Hard Knocks, everyone sees it and appreciates it. So I love Hard Knocks. Mm -hmm. And if I was leading an organization, I think I would be on the side of the fence saying, let's do it. Easy for me to say, I've never been on that side of, or never been in that position. But anyway, so the Lions kind of had this darling thing going on. But my question to you is, Long-winded question. With the way the Lions played and how they lost, if you were one who felt like you were starting to believe in the Lions and they're coming along, did that loss sway you at all? Or are you kind of like, no, 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 that was a great comeback. They're fighters. They're not there yet, but they're coming. Man, the Lions are just so gritty. I mean, that was a fun yeah. game to watch a little bit because, I mean, there was a lot of times where I know if the Vikings were in that position, we would have rolled over and we probably would end up losing by 20. Um, <laughs> it was – I'm just being honest. Yeah. The Lions, you know, they they, they stayed in it. Uh, they didn't lose their their minds mentally, which is a very big thing. Um, so I think the Eagles – I mean, we already talked about this in other episodes. I think the Eagles are a pretty good team. But um, I don't know. The, the Lions showed a lot of really good things. I wouldn't be excited for this year. I don't think the Lions are going to be there. I don't think Goff can lead them anywhere. But I do think there was a lot of bright spots there that just showed a lot of character and showed a lot of um, a lot of grit. Just, yep. you know, they, they can they can play. They, they can play. They just proved that they could play with one of the I think that what they lost by four. Uh, something yeah, like that it was like 34, 38. Yeah, 38, 35, something, something like that. Like that. Yep. 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 Um, I think I think they proved that they can play with the best of the best. And, you know, any given Sunday in the NFL, they might be the guys to take advantage of that. All so. right. So I will go along with you on that chase, but there's a caveat to it. And that is that they must win week two or else to me, it's the same old lions and yeah. it's the commanders coming to town and I'm not disrespecting the commanders, but 
It's two straight at home to start your season. You nearly came back with a, um, a rousing win over a much better team in the Philadelphia Eagles, but you came up short. We can understand that the commanders you need to beat then, you know, they're a little banged up on defense, uh, in Washington. They don't have chase young. Mm -hmm. Um, I think you got to beat this team. And I did see a stat that like for the first time in like 24 games, the lions are favored in a game. (laughs) Like, so Lions got to win this one, or to me, it's it's the same yeah. old Lions. So sure. that's a recap of the NFC North. Vikings in a good position, uh, certainly heading into Week Two with another key NFC game against the Philadelphia Eagles. We will preview that in just a moment. But first, let's take a spin around the NFL with some storylines. One of them, Chase, some fun finishes in Week One. Uh, the three that come to mind for me are Pittsburgh and Cincinnati went into overtime kicking problems uh, for the Bengals, uh, which was, you know, interesting and coincidental since last year in week one, it was kicking problems that helped the Cincinnati mm-hmm. Bengals beat the Vikings. Right. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the giants in Tennessee was a very cool ending with Brian Dayball uh, showing some guts and going for the victory, going for two after his team scored a touchdown to go down by one in the final seconds, they go for two, they make it Saquon Barkley, had a great game and punches it in for the two point conversion, I believe. And then their um, the Titans had a kicking problem, missed a field goal to win it. And then the third one, there were other exciting finishes, including new Orleans and Atlanta. But the third one that I would mention was the Denver Seattle game, uh, which had some interesting uh, things transpire at the end of the game with some coaching decisions on the part of Nathaniel Hackett and the Denver Broncos, but the Seahawks pull maybe one of the bigger upsets of week one Mm -hmm. uh, by winning that game. So those were some fun finishes in the NFL in week one Um, of those games or any others chase anything stand out to you uh, from that week one slate of games? Um, The biggest one for me is just looking at that Monday night game. I think that the Broncos lost that game more than the Seahawks won it. Sure. Um, the Seahawks put up 17 points. I, I could have predicted that in a loss for them. Um, I think that the um, the Broncos just fumbled and uh, literally fumbled, I guess. Yeah. Um, they just didn't play the way anyone expected um, was expecting them to. So yeah. I think they kind of beat themselves up there. I'm very excited to see how they bounce back week two. And then the other one is Pittsburgh, Cincinnati. We learned two things there. I think it's how important um, the holder is on field goals. Yep. And yep. then also it proved that McPherson is uh, he's human. So he I guess he phenomenal. is human after all. Yeah, you're right. Right, Which no one really thought, but it's good to know for the rest of the kickers that yep. you can still mess up and be at the top. So, uh, you know what, Chase, this is a sort of an in the weeds, a little talking point. I will not spend more than 60 seconds on it. I promise. But you brought up the, the fact of how important the operation is in a field goal or, mm-hmm. or in, in kicking with the, the holder. There were a couple of bad holds and bad snaps uh, for the Bengals. And it, it is a key, a key part of your team. It's a key part of your team is mm-hmm. your battery, your special teams, battery, long snapper, holder, and kicker. And we can have a debate all day long about how fair or not it is that these kickers and these specialists can trot out onto a field at the end of a game and determine the outcome after these warriors have been going at it for 59 mm-hmm. minutes and 30 seconds. And now we're going to have these kickers decide the end of the game. That's a whole episode of the Wobcast yeah. 2.0 on its own. Uh, but the bottom line is it's a part of the game. And if you don't have a good uh, long snapper and a good holder, I mean, you're at a significant disadvantage with how many games come down to kicks. Yep. Um, a couple of other things I want to mention about week one of the NFL key injuries, Dak Prescott um, broke his thumb, had surgery, will be out for at least a month. TJ Watt had an injury to a peck. Um, typically, a torn or injured peck can mean surgery and out for the year. Steelers are optimistic that Watt will be back. Huge, huge turn of positivity for the Steelers. No TJ Watt for the Steelers, and that's a team to me that sort of begins to fall out of contention in what will be a very tight division in the AFC North. Also, Najee Harris banged up in that game with a foot, but he's expected to play against the Patriots, and if not against the Patriots, he'll be back in week three. Uh, Chris Godwin of the Buccaneers hurt a hamstring, so he may miss some time. One of Tom Brady's key weapons, although they did sign Russell Gage away from the Falcons this offseason, who can help sort of stem the tide there in Godwin's absence. And lastly, Jamal Adams for the Seahawks uh, tears his quad out for the year. Huge loss for Mm -hmm. the Seahawks coming off of a huge win. Geno Smith was a surprise positive performance for me. The New York Giants were a surprise positive uh, performance for me. And then I'm with Chase. The Giants were a surprise negative performance for me, and I thought their negativity and their uh, underwhelming performance 
outweighed what the Bears did positively in week one. I do believe the Bears have a pretty uh, subpar roster, and I've been critical of them leading up, leading up to this season, but they kind of they showed us in week one. Uh, I don't think that's going to be a trend. Uh, I think the Bears will have a top five pick in the draft, and, and they may be a team with good management now, head coach and GM now, but there's some rebuilding that's going to have to happen there uh, for the Chicago Bears. So pretty disappointing performance uh, by the San Francisco 49ers in week sure. one. All right, uh, before we get out of here, Chase, let's take a look ahead here to the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, Monday night football, home opener for the Eagles. Um. You know, the atmosphere at Lincoln Financial Field, which I think they still call it Lincoln Financial Field, is is awesome, you know. And yeah, they're, they're a bunch of a-holes uh, at times, you know, who who booed Michael Irvin when he was like laying on the ground, like looked like he was almost paralyzed. They're booing him. They boo Santa Claus. You know, they, they're throwing batteries at us in the NFC Championship game, like whatever. Um, they're pretty nasty there, but the bottom line is it's a great home field advantage. It's outdoors. That place is going to be raucous. I mean, that place will be, will be rocking. Uh, they beat the lions. It's their home opener. It's Monday night. It's the Vikings. That is going to be a great atmosphere. Can't wait to watch the game. Um, I was impressed with the ESPN broadcast of Joe Buck, Troy Aikman, um, really liked that. So I'm looking forward to that being a part of a Vikings, uh, Monday night football matchup. Thought that was pretty cool. I didn't see, did they advertise a Manning cast for this game? I did not see that. Okay, so there may be the Manning cast for this, so that yeah. would be cool if, if they do have it. Um, from a game flow and style standpoint, um, you know, how, Chase, how there's always sort of some misnomers or misconceptions about things, how it's like you always think something's going to go one way and it kind of goes the other. Yeah. A, a lot of times when, when I hear uh, people talk about, hey, we're on the road, crowd noise is going to be loud. We got to control that. We got to run the ball and take the crowd out of it. You can take the crowd out of it by running the ball. Well, I mean, that, that is a way to do it. Mm -hmm. And the Vikings have a good running back and a good scheme, I think. So that is a possibility for them, but that's not the only way to take the crowd out of a game. So if you don't think that you are a team that can do that, or if you think the team you're playing is going to be pretty good at stopping that, that the run game, you're, you're not screwed. You can still manage the environment and control the crowd by big explosive plays in the passing game. And I've been in plenty of stadiums, Chase, where visiting stadiums or even home games for when I was with the team where the opponent, the away team, they're throwing the ball a lot early in the game and deep passes. When the ball's in the air, the crowd's quiet. Mm-hmm. Okay. Cause they're like, Oh, what's going to happen. And when that's a completion, it quiets them down. It is a lot. It's very difficult for the crowd to get back up, get back up to that level of noise after a 47 yard completion to Justin Jefferson on the second play of the game. So okay. to me, what I expect coming off of week one, where the Vikings did enough in the run game and have Dalvin cook, I expect them to be aggressive through the air early against the Eagles in an attempt to quiet the crowd down. So from a style and a flow standpoint, I expect to see the ball in the air from the Minnesota Vikings. Mm -hmm. um, I expect the Eagles to be moving the ball on the ground quite a bit early on. And the reason for that is twofold. One is, I think that's the smart thing to do um, right now for them against this Vikings defense is to make sure they're not one dimensional because I don't know that the Vikings can cover a talented passing offense the whole game. I think Green Bay's passing offense could become talented over time, but it's not right now. So I don't think the Vikings were really tested in coverage. The Eagles can test them in coverage. So I think the Eagles would be wise to keep the Vikings honest in the run game, force five or six defenders in the box to stop the run game and make that secondary cover. The second reason I expect the ball to be on the ground quite a bit for the Eagles running the ball is because of Hertz mobility. And if things are covered up, Hertz can tuck it and run. So I expect Jalen Hurts to salvage some plays and some series in this game by picking up first downs on the ground. Uh, and we'll see if the Vikings can contain that and can, can adjust and can contain that over time. If they can contain Jalen Hurts and disallow him from picking up first downs with his legs, I think the Eagles uh, will be hard pressed to score enough points to match the Vikings in this game. Um, let me, let me um, 
let me give this one to you, Chase. Mm -hmm. We just saw Jair Alexander and uh, Justin Jefferson. Now we will see Darius Slay and Justin Jefferson. Does that matchup excite you? Or do you think it's so overwhelmingly in favor of Jefferson that it's not really a matchup? I just think based off of what we saw, I mean, here's the thing. I think very highly of Jair and seeing what Jefferson did to him on Sunday, Darius Slay, I, what is he going to do better? Okay. I, you know, I just, I think Jefferson's going to eat again. So yep. until I yep. see, it, until I see him not do that again, I, yep. I'm going to keep expecting it. So I agree with you on Slay, much respect for Darius Slay, mm -hmm. but I think Jefferson is at a better place right now. <clears throat> um, the difference here, I think the challenge is a little greater for the Vikings because they are on the road. And I think the Eagles will have a better accounting of themselves from a pass rushing standpoint than the Packers did. Um, and a big part of that will come from the interior pass rush and Fletcher Cox. That's my second matchup to watch as Fletcher Cox against the interior of the Vikings offensive line. I have more confidence in the Eagles in this one than I do in the Vikings. Fletcher Cox against the interior of the offensive line. So I don't know if you had a chance to go back and watch the interior of the offensive line chase or look at any PFF grades or if you remember anything specifically from the game. But did, would you have concerns with the Vikings two guards and the center, Bradbury, against the Eagles defense here? Um, just comparing the two between the Packers and the Eagles, I think the Eagles have a lot better um, front uh, – defensive front than the Packers did yeah um so I'm gonna say yes especially as a Vikings fan that's always been a problem for us so it's we have a one game sample size right now so yep. I just don't want to, even if it was good you, I just don't trust it yeah okay understandable um all right let's get out of here with a prediction on the game Vikings are at the Philadelphia Eagles in this one um we've kind of previewed it we've broken it down um you know I think there's a, a lot of ways this one could go and with as, as well as the Vikings started the season off chase, you know, I think the Eagles will win this game coming back home for their home opener on a Monday night. Um, I think their win was emotional and, and dramatic, but I think the Vikings took more of an emotional toll out of them than the Eagles had taken out of them from an emotional toll standpoint. Mm -hmm. To me, the Eagles, it was more of a relief that they won that game on the road against Detroit. Like that would have been an, not an embarrassing loss, but that's, you know, if you're an Eagles fan and you're going through the schedule before the season, marking down wins and losses, don't you think you had that one as a win? Right. Yeah. yeah, I do too. So I think they are just relieved. I don't think they're drained emotionally. The Vikings, if they're not careful, could suffer from some emotional drainage uh, after beating the Packers the way they did at home, home opener, week one, new coach, new GM, Kirk Cousins, Aaron Rodgers, like the whole thing was, was draining. So they got to bounce back from that and... I think they're up for the challenge and I think they'll look good, but I think they're going to come up short in this game. And I expect the Eagles to win prediction for you, Chase. Um, for me, I look at um, the connection between Jalen Hurts and AJ Brown was phenomenal on Sunday. Um, and I think one of the main reasons if you look at our game on Sunday that we played so well is because we put so much pressure, constant pressure on Aaron Rodgers that he never got time to throw the ball. Um, yeah. He was frazzled. And I just don't think our D-line can do that on Philly's O-line. Sure. Um, I think Jalen Hurts is going to have way too much time. He's going to be way too comfortable. And then you add in the fact that it's a Monday night game, primetime game in Philadelphia. I just I, I see a really high scoring game, but I don't see it in our favor. I would go 33-27 Eagles. Okay. So so you and you see a high scoring game here. Yes, for clearly, sure. right? Yeah, you yep. do. Okay. Um, yeah, it's you know, I I don't feel like super strongly uh, about it. Like, like the Vikings have no shot to win it. I'm kind of with mm -hmm. you. I think it's going to be a good close game, but I think it's going to be a game where at the end of the day it's over. And like Scott Van Pelt is talking about it. And it's like, what a great game. Like, yeah, you know, the Eagles kind of in control of this thing, but the Vikings were right there. Looks like both these teams will be in it to win it at the end, maybe a playoff, you know, matchup down the road, like a preview of a playoff matchup down the road. Um, so you know, and, and we'll, we'll break it all down after the game in episode five of the Wobcast. Uh, but that's sort of what we anticipate happening here in week two for the Minnesota Vikings. If it comes out the other way and the Vikings win the game and they're two and oh, well, we'll be happy to see that and happy to talk about that. But, uh, looks like the view from the Wobcast 2.0, at least is that, uh, the Eagles will win this game, become two and oh, the Vikings will be one and one, but only time will tell. 
I know that it killed our buddy Giles to not be able to participate in the swab cast, but I also see that he's stuck around and has been listening to the whole thing. So he's had a poor connection, not able to participate, but he's stuck here. He listened. So he will uh, have, I'm sure he'll be working with you, Chase, to chop this thing up and make it sound good. And we'll get his thoughts on the Vikings victory over the Packers and their performance in week two against the Eagles next week on episode five of the Wobcast where Giles will make his return. Uh, for now, though, that's it. We've got episode four in the books. The Vikings are preparing to play the Philadelphia Eagles in week two of their season. Very excited to watch this game on Monday Night Football to see how it unfolds. And we're very excited that you all have chosen to listen to the Wobcast 2.0. Thank you for being here. Again, I'm your host, Wobby, Mike Wobshop, along with Chase and Giles. Glad you found the Wobcast, and we hope you find many more. This is episode four, so we've got three episodes already done. We had those in the library ready to go for you. So once you found episode four, you could go back if you want and listen to the first three episodes where we uh, sort of introduced ourselves in episode one, broke down the NFC and the AFC in episodes two and three, gave some predictions, talked a little gambling, talked a lot of different things, um, and set up the season. And now we have actual football to talk about. And we're very excited to do that. And we're going to continue doing that throughout the course of the 2022 NFL season with one Wobcast 2.0 episode per week, at least maybe we'll drop a bonus one every now and then if I can get chase to break away from his busy schedule and work with me. So right, chase. <laughs> all right. We'll see. All right. All right. Um, you can find the Wobcast 2.0 where you can find all of your podcasts that you like to listen to Spotify, Google podcasts, Apple podcasts. You can also find us on YouTube. So make sure you check that out. And another thing we really want you to do is participate with us, help us generate some content. Let us know what you want to hear or what you don't want to hear. The two best ways to do that are on Twitter, where you can find me at Wobby, W-O-B-B-Y on Twitter. Now that we've dropped these episodes, I'll get a little more active on Twitter and interact with you guys there. Drop us a line, drop us a question, drop us a comment. We love interacting with you and having listeners drive the content of the Wobcast 2.0. The other way is emails. The real Wobcast at gmail.com is where you can find us on email. I or we will respond to every email that gets sent in, just as I did for 15 seasons with the Minnesota Vikings. So that's going to do it. Much has changed for the Wobcast. We are now the Wobcast 2.0, no, no longer officially affiliated with the Minnesota Vikings, but still very much a fan of what they do and following them very closely. And we hope you follow along with us here at the Wobcast 2.0. On behalf of executive producer Chase and my co-host Giles, this is Wobby signing off for now. Skull Vikings. <laughs>